Our first presentation this afternoon is from Lucy Bell, who has a BA in education from the University of North Dakota and an MA in education with a minor in cultural anthropology from the University of Colorado. She retired after 35 years as a teacher, yes, an educational writing consultant. She is an instructor for the Pillar Institute for Lifelong Learning and a native plant naturalist at Cheyenne Mountain State Park. She founded the Friends of Emerson Discussion Group now in its 10th year. Lucy is a writer currently researching the black community of Colorado Springs in the 1930s and 1940s. Her philosophy of life is in one word, connect. So connect us, Lucy. <laughs> As racial divisions rend our multicultural nation, the importance of history in exposing past injustices emerges as a source of healing. How can we move on when we don't know where we've been? I want to give you some words of Maya Angelou, whose memorial service was held this morning at Wake Forest University. This is from her poem on the pulse of, morning, of the morning. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived. But if freed with courage, need not be lived again. Today I will give you four stories that illustrate how through courage in the face of racial injustice, the subjects in this presentation were benefactors to their families, the Colorado Springs community, and human spiritual progress. The vehicle for my presentation is story. The common thread is light. The inner light of individual courage and the universal light of human conscience. First story, the Quaker founds a town. William Jackson Palmer grew up in Philadelphia in the tumultuous time before the Civil War. Pro-slavery advocates were pitted against abolitionists, but in Palmer's Quaker family, there was no confusion. Every human contained the divine spark, and slavery was unquestionably wrong. Yet, in 1861, 25-year-old Palmer found himself in conflict. His religion upheld pacifism, and Palmer believed that war was inconsistent with the teachings and example of Jesus Christ, and therefore wrong. He believed equally that slavery was wrong. Seeking guidance from within, he later wrote, the inner light made it very clear to me in the summer of 61 that I should enter the army. He was an outstanding leader, eventually awarded the Medal of Honor. After the war, he became a surveyor for the Kansas Pacific Railroad, traveling through the West and Southwest. George Motley, a former slave who had been a part of his Union Cavalry Regiment, joined him as cook and orderly. In 1870, Palmer organized the Denver and Rio Grande Railway and in 1871 staked out the town of Colorado Springs. When black people began arriving in the 1870s and 80s, Palmer's policy was clear. There would be no discrimination in his town. Opportunities existed regardless of race. Among the many black businesses owned were livery stables, tonsorial parlors, two newspapers, a publishing company, a dairy, grocery stores, fuel and hauling services, tailoring and dressmaking shops. Blacks were self-employed in construction, catering, laundry services, landscaping, horse breaking, and blacksmithing. Palmer paid his white and black workers the same wages for the same jobs. He gave land for the first black church, Payne Chapel. Second story, the pastor shovels coal. 
Reverend Kimball Dolphus Stroud knew it was time to move. Oklahoma Territory, where KD graduated from Langston University, provided opportunities for minorities. A pastor and teacher, KD had studied law and been a delegate to the Oklahoma Territorial Convention. He wanted at least as much for his children. When Oklahoma became a state in 1907, segregation moved in. He could see the doors slamming shut. KD heard that Colorado Springs schools were not segregated. Using their life savings to pay for the trip, the Stroud family arrived in Colorado Springs in May of 1910. But sadly, the Quaker founder of the city, champion of equality for all people, had died in 1909. After Palmer's death, job opportunities for blacks plummeted. KD learned that even with 10 years teaching experience, being hired as a teacher was out of the question. Colorado Springs had never had a black teacher in any of its schools and would not have one until 1954, 12, 16 years after KD's death. And that first black teacher, by the way, was Nina Stroud, KD's ninth child. His family was growing. He had to do something. The only job he could get was shoveling coal for the Rock Island Railroad in Roswell, five miles north of town. He walked to work every day, seven days a week, and worked 10 hours a day shoveling coal from the 60-ton railroad cars into coal chutes. He was paid by how much he shoveled each day, seven cents per ton. Yet during this time, KD managed to save enough money to buy a horse and wagon. He used it first to haul baggage, then went on to trash, ashes, gravel, fertilizer, and other commodities. By the late 1920s, he was able to buy trucks. The Stroud Brothers Trucking Company was formed and provided jobs for his sons and other black and white workers. In 1927, he started the first contracted regular trash hauling service in the city. And finally, Reverend Stroud was able to return to preaching, serving St. John's and Trinity Baptist churches. He became active in politics and spoke out against discrimination. Third story, Journey Toward Olympus. Kelly Dolphus, third child of K.D. and Lula Stroud, found growing up in Colorado Springs difficult. He recalled, quote, to be forced to carry a pocket full of rocks at all times for a measure of self-defense against unprovoked attacks, to be unable to eat food inside any of the numerous restaurants in Colorado Springs, and to be harassed by the police to the point where Negro youngsters were constantly under the threat of being kidnapped from the streets and taken to City Hall and forced to dance and clown for the entertainment of the police were among the minor irritations one faced daily." Close quote. Not allowed to be on the high school track team, Dolphus became a premier distance runner on his own. He graduated from high school with honors. In 1927, he entered Colorado College and joined the track team. In March 1928, he set a new record for the fastest round trip of Pikes Peak, three hours and 10 minutes round trip. In June of 1928, he won the 5,000 meter regional competition in Denver, which qualified him to enter the Boston tryouts for the 1928 Amsterdam Olympics. He had no money for the train ticket to Boston, and no one stepped forward to chip in to allow him to ride with the rest of the all-white team. Dolphus would not let his dream die he decided to hitchhike the 2,000 miles to Boston. At 4 a.m. on June 25th, with a canteen for water, a golf club for protection, and a $10 bill in his pocket, he set out. 
Milk at 12 cents a quart, peanuts at two cents a pack, comprised the bulk of his nourishment. The grueling cross-country trip in the summer heat took 13 days, and he arrived in Boston six hours before the race began on July 7th. He had paperwork to fill out, his body ached, and he was weak from a lack of food and sleep. He'd saved an extra pair of shoes for the race, but his feet were so swollen and blistered he could barely get them on. Though he'd given it his best, Dolphus collapsed after six laps into the race. He worked in a restaurant to earn money for the train ticket home. He went back to Colorado College, was elected to Phi Beta Kappa, and graduated cum laude in 1931. He became a writer, teacher, coach, and businessman, and continued to work for the rights of minorities throughout his life. He was inducted into the Colorado College Athletic Hall of Fame in 2006, 31 years after his death. Fourth story, Poppin' Rags. After Palmer's death in 1909, when Black Job Choices nosedived, the tonsorial powers, uh, parlors were downsized to shoeshine shops. This was still a black job, but without the trappings. Yet Earl McAdams was not dismayed. His boot black shop opened in 1921 at 27 and a half South Tejon thrived. In 1935, Todd Colbert began the Golden Cycle Shine Parlor at three and a half South Tejon. In the 40s, he moved to 27 and a half South Tejon, and in 1943, began an establishment at 109 and a half South Tejon next to Lorig's Western Wear. Jesse Colbert, Todd's father, had worked as a driver for the Lorig business in the 1930s. Mr. Lorig welcomed Todd to his new location and encouraged him to expand his shop to include retail sales. Todd managed this successful downtown business until 1958 when he sold it to John and Elizabeth Crow. Todd employed both blacks and whites over the years. At times, being successful brought new risks. The KKK was active in Colorado and Benjamin Stapleton was elected mayor of Denver in 1923. Another Klan member, Clarence J. Morley, was elected governor of Colorado in 1924. The Klan's official power decreased over the years, but they were still around. During this time, there were at least three attempted lynchings, usually of black businessmen, and frequent cross burnings. When outspoken anti-segregationist Kimball Stroud Goffman bought a house in the 300 block of West Mesa Road, it was burned down by the Klan the next day. Our third businessman is Leroy Curvin. He worked at the Cohen boot shop on Tejon between Kiowa and Pikes Peak until he earned enough money to start his own shop, which he named the Green Parrot. First located near Acacia Park, he later moved to 214 East Pikes Peak Avenue between Weber and Wasatch Streets. After Camp Carson was established in 1942, many of Leroy Curvin's clientele were military, and spit shining combat boots became a daily procedure. The Green Parrot at 214 East Pikes Peak later became Kinko's. Some of you may remember that. The building was demolished in 2008. I'm going to close my talk with a somewhat literal slant on my light theme. We're going to go to the Green Parrot down in the basement and turn the lights on down in the basement. <laughs> this is an actual photo which I took in 2002. It was virtually, this is downstairs in Kinko's, it was virtually unchanged since the 1940s. And I'm now going to take you back in time to a summer day in 1943 with a true story as remembered by my late husband, Oliver Bell, who worked in the Green Parrot as a shoeshine boy. So we'll go back to the basement because that's where you're gonna be for about the next five minutes. Eventually you'll get there. <clears throat> it's called, the name of the story is Yoakum in the Dark. Up and down, left hand, right hand, snap. 
Oliver, peeking through the window of the green parrot shoeshine shop, smiled as he watched Dad Curvin popping her eggs. A tall Camp Carson soldier stepped down from the chair, his combat boots shining. He handed Dad a quarter and a 10 cent tip as he walked out the door on Pikes Peak Avenue. Oliver slipped inside and watched Dad assemble the bottle of white liquid polish and black paste he'd need for the next customer's two-tone shoes. Sammy Oliver's friend was shining the brown dress shoes of a man in a business suit. The row of six chairs held two more customers, but Dad took time for Oliver. You looking to shine shoes, young man? Yes, sir. Lots of soldiers coming home from the war. I can use another hand. Can you start today? Oliver nodded and waved at Sammy. Oliver knew most of the other shoeshine boys. Jackie, who was in fourth grade with him and Sammy at Helen Hunt School, Johnny and Bud from his Sunday school class at People's Methodist, and the Bailey twins, Billy and Bobby. They were 14 and went to South Junior, and they were famous for picking fights and causing trouble. <laughs> One morning in July, a new guy uh, named Willie showed up for work. He looked about 12 and had conked hair slicked back against his head. One o'clock jump was playing on Dad's radio, and Willie did a fancy dance step to the music. That caught Billy and Bobby's attention. They swaggered up to Willie, shoulders thrown back. First day, Bobby asked. First day here, Willie folded his arms across his chest. I shined shoes before. Billy stepped closer. You don't know how to dance. Bobby closed in on the other side. Something's wrong with your hair. Uh, hey, Dad Curvin called. Bobby, come in here. Need you to put new heels on some shoes. People will be picking them up in an hour. Bill, you can help him. The twins followed Dad inside, and Willie joined Oliver on the sidewalk. Those guys think they tough or something? Oliver shrugged. Listen here. Willie talked low into Oliver's ear. They don't know tough. I only been in this town for two months. I'm from Chicago. <laughs> know what I got? He lifted his shirt so Oliver could see something stuck in his belt. Looked like a knife. That's what it is, and I knows how to use it. A rainy Saturday left all the green parrot chairs empty. The boys showed up anyway. An hour rolled by, but dark clouds still hid Pike's Peak. Billy Bailey spoke up. Ever been in Dad Curvin's basement? Basement? Didn't know we had one. Well, he do. It's below ground, dark as anything. We'll ask Dad Curvin if we can show you. Everybody jumped up. It sounded more interesting than sitting around in the rain. Go ahead, Dad Curvin told Billy. Nothing down there except my shoe spray bench. You stay away from that. Bobby turned on the light switch at the top of the stairs and stood by it. Billy led everyone else down the steep wooden steps to the damp floor enclosed by gray cement walls. Billy stood in the center of the basement. Now here's how the game works. What game, Johnny asked. The game I'm going to teach you. It's called yoke them in the dark. We turn off all the lights and start moving. You can't touch nobody. If anybody touches you, you have the right to hit them as hard as you can. Turn off the lights, Bobby. Oliver stuck his hand in his front of his face. He couldn't see it even when he brought it close to his nose. Everybody heard Bobby clambering down the steps. Then it was silent. Should he move or stay still? Oliver thought about how hard the Bailey twins could hit. Then he thought of something even scarier, the knife in Willie's belt. He could hear the sound of breathing and careful footsteps. I'll stay close to the wall. If I run into somebody, I'll hit, better hit them first. He edged along the cold cement. His ears felt like they could double in size. Oh no, he'd reached the corner where the other wall began. He didn't want to turn around because he knew that at least one person was behind him. Maybe the middle was the safest as all. Oliver crept about 10 slow steps away from the wall when he touched somebody. Doubling up his right fist, he swung with all his might. Bam, crunch. The punch landed smack on somebody's nose. Yow, who did that? You broke my nose, you possum bait. Turn those lights on now, Billy Bailey. Billy scrambled up the stairs for the light switch, everybody running every direction, not caring if they bumped into somebody or not. The big light bulb hanging from a cord in the ceiling came on bright and blinding. Willie pulled himself up from the floor. Blood ran from his nose into his mouth and down his chin. 
all right, who did it? You gonna pay. Sammy pressed himself against the wall. Not me. Not me. Johnny had managed to get to the steps, sitting up straight like he was in Sunday school, his fingers clenching the bottom step. Not me, Bud and Jackie answered at the same time. Oliver rubbed his right knuckles with his left hand, where the where fingers were still stinging from the punch. Not me. <laughs> um, but by the time he answered, Willie was glaring at the Bailey twins. It's just a game, Billy sneered. Bobby moved over. Can't you take it? Willie looked like he wanted to take them both on, but he only had one hand. He had to use the other one to keep wiping his nose with the bottom of his shirt. He stomped up the stairs, just missing Johnny's fingers. At the top, he flicked the light switch off and on. Dumbass game, he snarled down at them and disappeared out the door. The room was silent. Oliver spoke first. Maybe the rain stopped. Maybe there's some customers. <laughs> rain ain't stopped and ain't no customers, Bobby declared. Time for round two of Yoakum in the Dark. <laughs> Just gonna go see. Oliver scampered halfway up the steps before anybody could stop him. Baby Billy Bailey called after him. Oliver didn't care. Grandma most likely had sweet potato pie waiting for him in the oven. The Baileys could call him ba baby for the next hundred years. He could take that easier than another round of Yoakum. <laughs> Leah Davis Witherow is our next speaker. She's the Curator of History at the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum. For over a decade, she's taught American History at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, and her courses have included colonial history, Colorado history, public history, and material culture, as well as the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era. She received her MA in History from UCCS, has achieved archival certification through the Academy of Certified Archivists, can archivists be certified? Yeah. Certified in what? <laughs> she, she's a friend, okay. And is former president of the Society of Rocky Mountain Archivists. Lee is a frequent contributor to the Pikes Peak Regional History Symposium and book series. Leah. Thank you. Good afternoon. And uh, just on that note, archivists are certifiably crazy. Yes, I, we love history. Uh, my question, my essential research question is, what forces shape the ideas, beliefs, and actions of General William Jackson Palmer? Who influenced his successes, his failures, and eventually his philanthropy? How did he become a bigwig and benefactor? The man on the iron horse, if you will, also known as the man who impedes traffic at the intersection of Platt and Nevada Avenues. Um, and when we look at his influences, there's no Darth of people who influenced Palmer, um, including Hicksite Quaker, fellow Hicksite Quaker Lucretia Mott, Pennsylvania Railroad magnate J. Edgar Thompson and Thomas A. Scott, uh, Charles Ellett Jr., who was one of the most brilliant engineers in the mid-19th century and devised all kinds of fantastic engineering solutions to nature's challenges, to bridges and roads and things like that. He also, of course, had amongst his close group of business and personal associates here in Colorado Springs, men like Dr. William Bell, William Sharpless Jackson, and Henry McAllister. But it's someone fairly unknown to most people in Colorado Springs that I choose to focus on. But I believe that George Foster Peabody, pictured here to the right in this photograph, General Palmer is to the left, the gentleman in the middle is unfortunately unidentified, and George Foster Peabody is towering to the right of the photograph. I believe George Foster Peabody was perhaps the most important and continued uh, both personal friend and influential business associate of Palmer throughout his life. George Foster Peabody was born in 1852 in Columbus, Georgia. Both of his parents, however, were New Englanders. His father had come south seeking business opportunities, and he found them. Uh, George Henry was his father, and Elvira Canfield uh, 
uh, Peabody was his mother. They built a beautiful home in Columbus, Georgia, and George Henry built a very prosperous mercantile company in the 1850s. And at this time, Columbus, Georgia was a, a mercantile center. There were a number of cotton mills in the area, and it was a very prosperous town. George Foster Peabody was the oldest of three sons, and he grew up in a house uh, with slaves uh, doing household chores. They were quite well off. His mother tutored him until he was about 10 years old when he was sent to a private school in Columbus. And then later he attended briefly the Deer Hill Institute in Connecticut. And despite the nearly 16 year age difference between General William Jackson Palmer seated in his study at Glen Erie on the left and George Foster Peabody seated in his office on the right, the men built a very deep and lasting connection because both men were self-made and they had much in common. At an early age, both of them became providers for their family because in 1865, Columbus, Georgia, was the scene of a battle between Union and Confederate forces, after which the town was burned down and George Henry lost his building. And although he was deeply committed to this place and these people, and he hoped to rebuild his business, he wasn't ever able to do so successfully. And so in 1865, the family moved north to Brooklyn, New York, of all places. We don't exactly know why they chose Brooklyn, except it was a, a fairly prosperous town of a, a few hundred thousand people at that time. But George Henry was a broken man, both in spirit and in health, and he could only take odd jobs from time to time. Elvira took in boarders, and young George Foster Peabody, at the age of 14, went out to get a job to help support his family. He started as a messenger boy, and then he worked his way up to clerk and bookkeeper. He was ambitious, he was bright, and he was devoted to his family. Lacking a formal education, he spent his evenings at the Brooklyn Young Men's Christian Association. He called, in later years, he called the YMCA his alma mater because he went there every evening and he studied every book he could get a hold of. Uh, later on in his life, his colleagues and friends said that he was one of the best conversationalists, anything from poli politics to the economy to uh, literature and music. He could talk about anything. So obviously his alma mater did him proud. He also attended the Reformed Church of Brooklyn, where as a young man, he heard General Samuel Chapman Armstrong give a stirring speech about a new college that he recently founded. It was the Hampton uh, Agricultural and Mechanical Arts Institute, later to become Hampton College and today Hampton University. Uh, Chapman Armstrong was so convincing that young George Foster Peabody um, corralled the meager resources of his fellow Sunday school brethren and donated them to this young college. He also, at the Reformed Church, met none other than Spencer Trask, who was a man of extraordinary talents and was a leader in the financial industry in New York. He had come from a very distinguished Brooklyn family and was a graduate of Princeton University. Now, on a side note, both Spencer Trask and young George Foster Peabody fell in love with the same beautiful woman named Katrina. Spencer Trask was imminently more successful and he won her heart, but he did as a consolation offer Peabody a job at his firm. <laughs> And so in 1880, young George Foster Peabody joins one of the most prominent banking and investment firms in New York City. The firm specialized in financing electric lighting industry, including Edison's Lighting Company. They were participating in the nascent sugar beet industry in the United States and railroads. And George Foster Peabody was given the special task of investing and helping organize Western Railroad interest, and he would soon come to meet General William Jackson Palmer. Meanwhile, uh, Palmer was facing a series of enormous financial challenges. He was what you could say in deep financial straits. He had a number of enterprises uh, going throughout the 1870s and 1880s, 
Um, but he was faced with potential collapse of his empire in Colorado and complete financial failure. As he was traveling home from, uh, from Britain, after visiting his young family, his wife and his three daughters in 1882, he wrote a letter to his wife aboard the steamship Arizona. I've taken it very easy aboard ship, which shows me clearly all I require is rest from business. However, I shall have to plunge into the maelstrom tomorrow. My single purpose now is to rescue the various enterprises from the Gulf, which seems to yawn for them, and to save my friends and other investors from final loss if possible. If only I could have a year's rest first. I would devote the rest of my active life to this, but the reverse has come before I could get into proper condition. Not a word of this, however, because it would be used by the rapacious enemies which surround us to aggravate still further the difficulties of our position, and I must appear to be well and to keep cool for the sake of all of our interests. I cannot imagine what has occurred during the past week and almost dread to touch shore, lest some new calamity be known to me. But however bad it is, it must be met and the best made out of it. So I will prepare to face the worst. I shall lose the confidence of old friends in England and in America and cause them a great loss, I fear, which is the hardest thing to bear. People who have blindly trusted you. My little family is the oasis, the only green spot to which my mind can turn without distress and disappointment. So he's clearly nervous about the situation that awaits him once he reaches New York City. Interesting side note again is that a fellow passenger on board um, that he met and frequently dined with uh, encouraged Palmer, told him stories, cheered him up quite a bit, um, kept him in good humor, and that fellow passenger was none other than Oscar Wilde. So Palmer was in a precarious position in a precarious business. Investors both at home and abroad were dissatisfied with the dividends and the fall in the values of their securities in the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad, while meanwhile, Meanwhile, uh, local traffic in southern Colorado um, and the profits that might rise out of that local traffic were suffering greatly. And that was seen as due to intense competition from other railroads and the predatory pricing, meaning the undercutting in prices that larger railroads could offer local Colorado uh, residents instead of the baby Rio Grande with very shallow pockets. Railroads like the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe who had uh, stronger financial positions and could lower their prices to try to run the Rio Grande out of business. In fact, the narrow gauge had to charge high prices and they're constantly seeking to return some value to their investors to pay dividends that they earn the nickname the narrow gouge instead of the narrow gauge. Interestingly enough, of course, um, as you know, many of the investors in the early railroad industry in Colorado were both from Britain and from the Netherlands. Um, this is a copy of a trust deed at Colorado College. And one of the provisions of this trust deed for 40,000 pounds, about $5 million in today's funds, was that the DNRG maintain offices in London under their corporate agent, Mr. Renshaw Esquire, who would keep them, the British investors, apprised of what was going on in that far off land of Colorado. As things began to be more difficult for Palmer and his partners, they simply stopped communicating with Mr. Renshaw. And the angry British investors who attempted to gain information out of Mr. Renshaw were extremely frustrated. In May of 1884, they held a meeting, they demanded changes, they demanded information, despite the fact that the net earnings of the Rio Grande had gone from 195,000 in 1873 to about 2,700,000 in eight, um, excuse me, in 1883. All the while, Palmer and his business associates were desperately borrowing from one pool of, pool of money to pay dividends into another pool of money, one set of investors to another. The example on the screen is a cipher a code that Palmer devised in 1871 to be able to communicate secretly with Dr. William Bell. 
It's one of at least five codes in the special collections at Colorado College, and they're fascinating. This one is in 1871. Their railroad venture has barely begun. But you can see, um, if we were to psychoanalyze this a bit, and why not, it's kind of fun. Um, all of the cipher codes are illnesses, ailments, or terms re related to the body. It's almost as if Palmer had a disease that no one had a cure for. So are things like cancer, disease, surgeon, funeral, arm, leg, waist, diphtheria, all stand for a, a, a design or a charge that Palmer is instructing Bell to sell, to buy, to borrow, to plead, to beg, to get more money in any way he could. It's really a literal example of even as Palmer the engineer was succeeding, Palmer the financier was failing. And when you look at the correspondence between Palmer and Bell in this time period, it's just dizzying. It's overwhelming the extent that they were clearly out of their league in terms of getting enough financing to keep the railroad going. Um, and one letter from Bell to Palmer, he asked him to create one more company and their vertical integration of coal companies, land companies, real estate companies, engine companies in southern Colorado. And Palmer's response back to Bell is really interesting. He says, we can't do one more thing. We're clearly not doing what we are doing now well. And unless we could find a, a, a competent manager to manage our interest, we're going to become slaves to American business, much like our prestigious American peers. Clearly, by this time, they already had. By 1884, Palmer had resigned from the boards of the Denver Rio Grande, the Colorado Coal and Iron, and the Mexican National Railway. And um, even though he had resigned, he had been marginalized and really pushed out of all of these enterprises, which were part of his original vision. During this key period in Palmer's life, he became acquainted with George Foster Peabody when Peabody first visited Colorado in 1881. It was the start of a profitable business relationship, but also a deeply personal friendship. Despite the fact that Peabody was a staunch and lifelong Democrat, and Palmer was a staunch and lifelong Republican, the two found a lot of common ground, including support of the gold standard, and they were both virulently anti-imperialist. Why Peabody is so critical and important in really transforming Palmer from an engineer to a successful philanthropist it is because through Peabody's financial acumen and his contacts, he was able to reinvest and reorganize the Denver and Rio Grande Western, later named the Rio Grande Western Railway, um, they reorganized it to the tune of millions of dollars in 1889. And this is the railroad that they sold in 1901 for a profit of $15 million. At this time, Palmer actively, uh, he retired from active business engagements, and he begins to distribute his fortune. This is the first time he has truly become a millionaire. And he spends about $5 million in various charities and philanthropic organizations, one of which was Hampton University. Peabody had become a trustee in 1884. Um, and after Peabody's own retirement from business in 1906, he was Hampton's most prominent supporter um, and investor. When he died, he, it was thought he had a fortune of between three and $40 million. That's quite a wide range. Um, and the New York Tribune announced that he was abandoning business life for humanitarian effort. He said he never wanted to be rich, but he always believed he would be. Um, and interesting note, after the sale of the Rio Grande Western, Peabody came to believe that all government, uh, all railroads should be owned by the government after he made millions of dollars on his own. <laughs> so this is an image of Samuel Chapman Armstrong, the man largely responsible for f creating Hampton University. Um, and through Palmer and Peabody's connection, Palmer too began to donate to this prestigious university in Hampton, Virginia. This is Palmer Hall. Um, Palmer gave Peabody a trust of about $162,000 to invest in any way he saw fit on behalf of Hampton University. That's about $3 million in today's money. 
And one of the things they did was renovate a Marshall Hall, add wings to it. It now serves as the administration building. And Peabody also had these beautiful bronze plaques placed at Hampton University, Colorado College, Denver Union Railway Station, and the Colonia Station in Mexico City, in addition to Salt Lake City. Um, this is Trustee Hall that was paid for through Palmer's funds and his generous grant. Part of the Hampton philosophy is work, um, learning a skill and a trade. And even though over 84% of the first 20 years of their graduates went on to become teachers, they still felt it very important to be learn be for their students to be trained in agricultural and mechanical arts so that they could go out and train their own students. And of course, this is a photograph of 1904, the dedication of the Palmer Building. Uh, Peabody, out of his respect and certainly his deep interest in education, was appointed to the Board of Trustees of Colorado College in 1898. Peabody served in that capacity until 1932. He himself gave over $40,000 to the college, uh, including sizable donations to their permanent endowment. In 1904, President Slocum of Colorado College set out to raise $500,000 for a permanent endowment because their student population kept growing, so did their deficit. Shockingly, they had to raise the tuition in 1905 to $50 a year. <laughs> George Foster Peabody um, ended up marrying Katrina Trask. Uh, Spencer Trask passed away in 1909 and Peabody and Katrina married in 1920. They lived at her estate at Yaddo. Today, it still functions as a resort for artists and writers. It's a retreat space. It's a fabulous and beautiful building in upstate New York. He also generously doted, donated to the University of Georgia, not, not ever having attended, but it being in close proximity to his hometown of Columbus, Georgia. He's most well known for the Peabody Awards, today, which are given for distinguished achievement in meritorious public service in television, radio, and the web. They're given for quality rather than popularity. Finally, Peabody, of course, did contribute significantly to the permanent Palmer sculpture, um, the man on the iron horse in Colorado Springs. He wasn't present in 1929 when it was placed, but he had a beautiful address read aloud for his longtime friend and business associate. Peabody spent his last days in Warm Springs, Georgia, a resort that he largely helped fund and develop, along with his close friend, Franklin De Delano Roosevelt. It was Peabody who introduced Roosevelt to the resort in 1924. After a long series of illnesses, George Foster Peabody passed away March 4th, 1938, at the age of 85. Upon his death, the New York Times declared that during his life, George Foster Peabody had blazed a trail for other philanthropists to follow. His many gifts to our community, his deep friendship with William Jackson Palmer, and his long-standing record of philanthropy all make him a bigwig and benefactor worth noting in the Pikes Peak region. Thank you.